Welcome back to PJ Chain Design. This is PJ. I would like to help some of my YouTube fans and answering the questions not just about the CAD but also about the jewelry industry in this video. Are you ready? Let's get started. I was posting uh, questions on my YouTube community uh, one week ago and asking if anybody have any question, just not, not just the cab, but also the something related to the jewelry industry. And I have a lot of uh, good questions here. So I try to answer one by one if possible and do my best uh, to answer you based on my experience. So let's take a look on the first questions. So the first question is from Rodrigo. Rodrigo. Um, say hello, I really love your video. Thank you. I've been many uh, problem when trying to design the prong for the stone to be the casting wax. Could you please make a video about the best prong measurement? Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, um, let's take a look on this file that I have here. For this file here, um, because I don't know which kind of a prong set that you're talking about, so I try to uh, be in more general in the sense if you look at any of the stone setting from the top view and this is your prong right and disregarding the prong size the one thing really important is we do not want to have the stone cutting more than 20 percent of the prong sometimes if it is a shared prong the prong need to be bigger and you have to thinking about you want to maintain a good 80 percent of the prong here otherwise when you bend it and, and you know it, it may be break it another other things about the prong, you can make the prong bigger like this. Like that's fine, and it's super secure, right? So no way you can you can uh, break this prong. However, when you have the prong set like that, exactly it doesn't look good. So our goal is make the prong as small as possible, but has the strength to hold it. And the bigger prong, of course, is better strength but aesthetic it doesn't look good now it is uh is your your part here as a designer to decide it how big of prong you wanted to have it but you do not want to cut it more than 20 percent that's that's the things now the second thing that we are talking about sometimes we have shared prong so for example in the beading uh b setting uh scenario you may have the prong like this and um, each of the stone has a full prong on it, which will be fine. Uh, but so in some cases, yeah, the, the goal is try to get the stone as close as possible, disregarding how big they are. Ideally, if you can have them like completely close, that would be great. But a lot of time when we're getting a stone, we're not necessarily getting exactly the same size. For example, if you order one millimeter, uh, one millimeter stone, they may come in like a 1.1 millimeter or 0.9 millimeter and then you kind of need to sort it out or you just have to use whatever you have so we need to give a little bit room there so my goal is getting as close as possible but the distance in between here you want to maintain 0.1 to 0.2 millimeter okay so let's say disregarding how big this prong is and i'm going to have this guy right here and then I want to move the, this guy right in the middle and move it down, right? Now, so the stone not just cutting one from one side, the stone is cutting from both sides. So this prong needs to be a little bit bigger in order to uh, hold it on both sides, right? So if you are doing the shear prong, for example, you pretty much will get the size like that. Uh, and I hope that answers your questions. Um, there's no standard size for the prong. It's based on your design. And another example, for example, like if I did it those and this prong, I'm going to make it smaller. Right. And then you'll say, well, if I have four prong, I'm probably not going to hold it. That's right. But we can have more. So in the case, if you let's say I'm going to use the polar array on this one, uh, zero and instead of have four of them maybe I want to have ten of them you probably see this kind of a setting especially on the uh, cabochon um, you want to have a smaller prong but you have a more prong especially on an oval cabochon there's a certain style like that so if you have a smaller prong you can have a more prong or you have a bigger prong then you have a uh, uh, less number on it and it's all based on the design too if you are doing a small stone setting and you can only have a prong go small 
into the certain size. My experience for consider the shrinking about the 3D printing and also the casting and then you have to polish the mater material lost, you probably don't want to go anything smaller than 0.4 millimeter in diameter. So the prong that you have right here, if it's less than 0.4 millimeter, then you may have a problem for that prong to survive uh, till, the cast, uh, till the stone setting. All right, so I hope that answer your questions there. Let's take a look on the second questions. The second question is, PJ, I would like to know how much does it cost to make a silver ring from the design to final production The weighs about seven to eight grain. Okay, so in this question, it really depends on design. I don't know if you have the stone setting in there, uh, if the piece is complicated, you need to have the mold separate them into the two part. Is it for the custom make or it is for the production, right? So it's hard for me to answer it, but I would like to use this opportunity to talk about the production and what is involved in the production. All right, so let's talk about the fee structure to making one custom ring. Most of the time when we do the 3D printing, we are doing one of a kind work for most of the jewelry store. So I'm just gonna use a, a custom ring as an example, right? So, so what is involved is you need to have the CAD design and it depends on your location and who do you have the CAD model. Um, it could be a set price or it could be um, a hourly rate, right? Depends on the country too. Some of it is more expensive. It's some you can find a cheaper one. But uh, one of the good guidelines that you can take a look is uh, a website for the Upwork. If you go to the Upwork and you can open an account and they can post a job or you can just come in here, find for the talent, right? So if you're coming over here and you want to hire somebody to do the cat work and you want to type it jewelry uh, designer to be more specific, let's type it jewelry cat designer. All right, so because there's a, a little bit different there. So you can see like, for example, this person charged $40, $40 per hour and I have his check at US only and then you can uncheck it. You will see Lamo designer in like this one in Armenia is like $20 per hour, right? So you kind of get an understanding like how much that people will charge and there's uh, so many designer out there and you can contact them or you can post a job there for somebody to do in a cat work for you, right? So again, it depends on the design, the price may be different, location, uh, the price may be different, all right? The second thing is uh, you will need to get a 3D print, right? Now, again, depends on your location because you guys are all over the world. I don't know how easy that you can assess on the 3D printing, but giving you a guideline, if you take a look on um, the Staller website, and Staller is the largest uh, manufacturer in the United States, and you can kind of get an idea for like what they charge. Everybody charging differently, even in the United States, like uh, some of the uh, local jewelry store, they might have the printing machine and depends on the printing quality and also the complicated of the piece, how long does it take to print? the price will, will be different, but you will need to weigh in the printing price, sort of things like that. So Stalo is a good website for you to see kind of what US charge and depends on your location, that might be charged different, okay? So the second thing that you need to weigh in is the 3D printing price. Now the third one is the casting. Casting price including two things, right? So one is the labor and material, the material is based on the spot price. So gold and silver price is different every day. So you have to, you, you call maybe this week and then they will tell you a gram is for how many, how much money. But next week the gold price go up or, or go down, the price will be different, right? Labor price is pretty much uh, there. So that labor price is including that if they need to, if you're doing a multiple piece and they need to put the sprue on, uh, on your piece and how much per sprue and they will do investment and they will cleaning. Now you can go with the 
local jewelry store, some of the store they have their own facility doing a small scale, or you can go into more like a casting uh, manufacturing. I pers I live in the Michigan here uh, at Detroit, so I use this company it's called Flash Manufacturing at Michigan. This is their website and it is based on the Detroit area here in the Michigan. Uh, Matthew is really helpful. You can call him. He will willing to answer all of your questions. In fact, uh, I was having a series of the video about PJ Meet the Pros and I interviewed a bunch of uh, people from the jewelry industry, including Matt, and he's really generous to share his uh, knowledge about the casting, his setup, and you know all, all the detail about the casting. So I highly recommend you check on this video. It has a, already have a lot of information related to the casting. So after uh, the casting, then you will need a bench jeweler to help you on the finish and stone setting. And again, everybody should charge you differently. So I would like to include in this process here just for you to know like what does it take to make a, a custom jewelry. All right, so the next question is from Joshua, and um, he's asking the tip and challenging you face while trying to learn CAD, and what keep you going and stay focused learning ever since. Uh, whatever that you do, we all have up and downside. And uh, for me, learning CAD, uh, I was a graphic designer, and I and I hate the computer, so I I go to my master degree for metals and jewelry. And then involve, involving with the hand making and love the hand making. So I make a lot of the jewelry. And after that, uh, the CAD become a trend. And not only I teach in the jewelry, I also teach in the industrial design. So for me to learn CAD in order to deliver the material to my student, like what has happened uh, you know, in the industry, and I have to follow you know, the trend of the industry, I start learning CAD and fall in love with it. Now, do I have a downside to learning? Yes, at the beginning, it's so difficult because at my time, there's no YouTube. Uh, they were only Kali or, you know, very limited book that you can assess. So you guys are in the golden time that you can learn a lot of things from YouTube. I don't have it. So pretty much self-taught uh, for me to learn right now. And then um, when I learn Rhino, it's not just for jewelry purpose. Uh, I do model a lot of different things, especially everyday objects. If I'm driving, I see the wheel on the car, I will think about how am I going to get this surface. And, and if I'm and, you know, doing things, for example, you looking at this mouse and then you are really curious how, how the mouse and surfaces, how, how, does, how does it happen? You know? So um, I started learning CAD uh, here and there may interrupt a few times, but every time I'm thinking about what I'm going to deliver to my student, I want my student to get the best. And that is the most input and also challenging that I have is because I don't have much of a resource, but I do want to give my student the best. So my suggestion for you, uh, Joshua, if you have a downside, uh, downtime that you feel like it's difficult, try to model something that's interesting. Um, I do have a couple printer, one for jewelry and the other one just for fun. Um, you can buy something really cheap and FDM printing and you can print a lot of interesting things. Like I have, I have uh, like a per bird cage print and I put that video on the YouTube. Not a lot of people watching it, but I, I find fun for that. All right, so let's go to the next questions. And for today's time, we might only uh, able to answer one more questions. If you like the series, you can leave your comment below, ask me question, and I'll try to get back to this question as much as possible. And I may have another video for the rest of it. But the next question is from Peter. Uh, Peter, thanks me for the great video. You are really welcome. I enjoy sharing my knowledge. Uh, as long as I can help other people, I'm pretty happy. Uh, with that and also thanks for you guys support by watching it all the way and like and share it does help me on my ranking on the YouTube and so please like and share and leave the comment below all right so back to the questions uh, Peter is new I love to discuss the technicality of a jewelry production he's as asking about the thickness of the ring or the pendant it's really depend Peter um, because if you have a really wire construction 
you can only go so thin, right? And depends on the wire structure. So it's hard for me to talk about the thickness without seeing the, the design. Okay, so what is the most popular ring size to stock? The woman size is size seven, and you can go up and down if you only have really limited stock. Uh, so go up one size and go down one size. If you are in the production and you will need to get every size and because your jeweler can size up like up to three quarter size or size down three quarter size. But size more than one size, it, it depends on the design. It might bend uh, the shape of a ring, no longer round, maybe oval. Also, uh, Peter is asking for the bracelet size. Uh, bracelet, I think it's uh, about six, six and a half and seven inches long. If it is the link or if it is a cuff, it's a 60 millimeter in the longer diameter on the oval. We'll also love you to discuss the metal are good for the jewelry uh, other than precious metal. When you talk about that, you have to be specific. Are you talking about fine jewelry, costume jewelry, fashion jewelry? Because they use different metal. Uh, fine jewelry, of course, you gotta use a, a precious metal, precious stone, semi-precious stone. For the costume jewelry, then you are using the base metal and you can play over. So the next question, will you do good at plating aluminum and bronze? That I cannot answer that question uh, because I'm not a plating profession, but a lot of overseas jewelry that um, I'm, I'm consulting with, they are using the brass and then plate over for whatever color they wanted. Peter also asking like if if a certain part need to fill in color. Now the gold plating only come in certain color. Yellow gold, white gold, rose gold, right? And in different tone. Now if you are talking about color, I don't know if you are talking about resin because they do have a resin filling. It's like Koisne enamel. Um, instead of a glass uh, in a more industry way, um, mass production way you are filling it with the resin. So I think you might talking about filling a resin. If you like this section for me to talk about the experience, um, anything related to the jewelry, leave your comment below, like it, share it, and let me know if you have other questions. I will add it up to the next video. Thank you for watching. See you next.